Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. My name is Father Lawrence Sayre, and I'm the pastor here at Our Savior Parish in the USC Crusoe Catholic Center. We've got a great crowd tonight, more than we expected. I always like that when I have to bring chairs out. So thank you all for coming. And just out of curiosity, how did everybody hear about it? Just uh, b b b internet, flyers, what, uh, friends? Internet, okay, great, excellent. So uh, welcome to the Catholic Center. We've got uh, some nice food and snack for you uh, after, after the event. Uh, there'll be some questions and answers afterwards. I'll pass this mic out. If uh, somebody needs to run and use the John, it's right through that door right there. You'll see him right in front of you. And if you're um, um, looking for some coffee, we got Smiles Cafe over there. So we, we should have you covered for the next uh, two hours or however late we're going to go. Uh, I thought uh, we'd begin just with a little quick prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day, and we ask you to bless us, bless our speakers, and bless the nuns in whom that we will be learning about, and all those who come to make this world a better place. Help bring peace into our land, and lead us to recognize that when we work together, great things can happen. Amen. Amen. Great. Thank you all for coming, and now I'll turn it over. Good evening, everybody. I'm Bree Lascoda. I'm the managing director of the Center for Religion and Civic Culture. We are co-sponsoring this along with the Office of Religious Life, the Caruso Catholic Center, the School of Religion, the Knight Chair in Media and Religion, and of course, Spectrum. I hope I didn't forget anyone. But that tells you a little something about the vibrancy of religious of religious life and of the academic engagement of religion at USC. Uh, CRCC does a lot of study of nuns. Usually that's N-O-N-E-S. But uh, in large part actually to our work with the, uh, with the Conrad Hilton Foundation, we have started to engage more with nuns, N-U-N-S. And we met Joe Piazza, no relation to Mike Piazza, just, yeah, I'm sorry. In, in case anybody wants to leave now, <laughs> the exits are there and there. Joe is a phenomenal journalist whose um, achievements you can read about on her website, joepiazza.com. She is prolific in her writing, um, but more than the uh, number of articles that she's written on, it's the depth and the care with which she treats her subjects. It is hard not to fall in love with the nuns and you and us that she writes about. Uh, any USC students that are studying either religion or journalism in here? Fantastic. So you might want to uh, ask Jo how she fell into her career. She has a undergraduate degree from Penn. We don't play them in football, so that's okay. Um, in economics, yeah, everybody would beat you. <laughs> um, a uh, master's degree in journalism from Columbia and a uh, master's degree in religion from NYU. So I hope you enjoy this evening with us. I hope that you uh, learn to fall in love with the nuns as we have and enjoy the uh, talk. And it, don't forget that the book is for sale. We have a limited number of copies. So if you are excited to buy this book, get them while they're hot. Uh, Amazon had a deal on them, so they are only $10. And Joe will sign them after. So with that, welcome Joe Piazza. Thank you guys so much for having me. Uh, this is an amazing crowd, and it's been incredibly exciting for me. Just I've hung out on USC's campus today. I got to hear your marching band playing a little bit while I was wandering around. And as Bree mentioned, I went to Penn, which is home of the Fighting Quakers and <laughs> one of the losingest teams in the Ivy League, which we all know is one of the poorest excuses for college football in the country. So just being on this campus has been electric and exciting. And I just, I'm so grateful that I get to be here today. And I'm even more grateful that I get to be here today and talk about what has become one of my favorite subjects to talk about in the entire world, which is Catholic nuns. And I, if you had met me 10 years ago, you would not have thought that I would be up here talking to you about that. 
And so I can I want to back up a little bit to tell you a little about my history and how I fell into writing on this topic. I graduated, I started out my career in journalism as an intern at the New York Times. And I got that job right after September 11th. They advertised at my college newspaper for an intern in their Trenton Bureau, which was just 45 minutes from Penn. And after September 11th happened, they stopped returning my calls. They were a little bit busy. And I just kept showing up at the office and showing up every day. And finally, they just assumed that I worked there, <laughs> which was wonderful. And I, after I graduated, I asked them if I could work there. And this was you know, back when newspapers still really mattered. And they said, go work at a small newspaper in the middle of the country and come back here in 10 years. That's how this works. Little did they know what was about to happen. And so the only newspaper that would hire me in New York City while I was at Columbia was the New York Daily News. And the only job they would hire me for was as an assistant on their gossip column. And so I took that job. I wanted to stay in New York. And working for a New York City tabloid for the New York Daily News was exciting. That was awesome. I knew nothing about celebrities. And so on my first night out, I interviewed this. I didn't even interview. I just chatted with this wonderful man for about an hour. And I came back to the office the next morning. And I'm like, I think his name was Jay. And my boss was like, Jay what? And I was like, Z. And <laughs> he was like, did you record it? Did you write anything down? And I said, no. And he almost fired me right then and there on the spot. And I realized that I had to do my research. And um, I did. And I became very good at being a celebrity reporter. Eventually, I had my own column. And I became a senior uh, writer and editor at the New York Daily News. But I started my career writing about celebrities. And I, frankly, we live in this age where everything that a celebrity does is considered big news. I mean, these are the most read stories on almost every website. You go to CNN, you go to Fox News, and the top story is typically something that a Kardashian did. And that is partly my fault, and I apologize <laughs> greatly to the world for, for having done that. Um, but it informs what I'm about to tell you now. While I was at the Daily News um, covering Britney, simultaneously covering the 2008 election and Britney Spears' mental breakdown, I decided to go back to school for religious studies because I needed a break. Um, and I think only someone that is, is covering a pop star's breakdown would say, yeah, I'm just going to go study religion in my spare time because it makes me feel better about life. And while I was doing that, I started writing my thesis on how Catholic nuns were using social media. And so it was how Catholic nuns were using Twitter and Facebook. And the first question people would ask me is, I had no idea that Catholic nuns were even on Twitter and Facebook. They were, and they were fascinating. Um, I found one nun that was tweeting the entire rosary every single day. Um, another sister who was soliciting requests for prayers, and then she would pray for people through social media. Um, I had nuns who were tweeting about their nieces and nephews, and nuns who would tweet every inning of the Pittsburgh Pirates game. <laughs> and so through that, I began learning about the apostolic visitation, the investigation of nuns. And I became curious. I wanted to know more. I wanted to know about the secret lives of nuns. And one of the things that I learned early on is that nuns adore a good pun. And you tell a nonsense joke. And it usually, it's, it's a good icebreaker. And so I came up with this title for a project called Bad Habit, The Secret Lives of Nuns. <laughs> and I started interviewing some of the sisters that I met. And what ended up happening is I was looking for the, these secret lives of these women that I considered incredibly mysterious. And what I ended up finding was so much more important and so much more meaningful I found this group, and one nun ended up leading to another nun, ended up leading to another nun, um, of women who were brave and who were fierce and who were doing amazing things in the world whose stories had never been told. And all of these women were so incredibly humble that when I finally decided that this would be a book, each and every single one of them said, why would you write about me? I, I'm, I'm not interesting. I'm not doing anything remarkable at all. And these are women who are doing things like running one of the only safe houses in New York City for victims of sex and labor trafficking. 
Um, one of them has raised thousands of children of female felons while those women are in prison. When those women get out of prison, she has built them affordable housing. Uh, she built a $9 million apartment complex in a little under a year, something that takes the city of New York about 10 years to accomplish. Um, there is a woman who is fighting for equal rights for gay and lesbians. I have one sister who is 84 years old and has done 47 Ironman races. I, these stories are unbelievable, and yet still, each of the women said, I'm not that interesting. And so I told them a little bit about my background, and they were skeptical at first. They're like, you wrote about celebrities. Why do you want to write about us? Why do you care about us? And I said, because of what I see, I see the media clamoring for stories about those people who I don't think are at all extraordinary. I want to tell your stories in that way. I want to tell your stories as if you were celebrities and get people engaged in the remarkable things that you are doing to improve the world absolutely every single day. And they still balked. And then I asked if I could hang out with them for a while. And we eventually created these narratives and we created this book together. But that's my goal. And it was a lofty goal. And I thought that I would write this book and no one would really pay that much attention. But I would get the stories out there. I would get to tell the stories. And since it came out, it came out in early September, the reaction has been so positive and so overwhelmingly great from Catholics and non-Catholics alike, because these are stories of women who are living an incredibly authentic life that is so filled with meaning. And I think that that's something that we are all constantly looking for. And it's right there. They've been doing it. A lot of these women are in their 70s and 80s. They've been doing it for about 60 years. And each of the sisters I've talked to, the ones in the book, and I've done interviews with probably about 250 sisters at this point, uh, feel that same kind of feeling of living a very authentic life uh, because they chose something that was meaningful to them. And that's something that I convey in the book, and that is, uh, I think, where a lot of the positive reaction is coming from. So. I, that is my kind of spiel. I found that these things actually go a lot better when we just start asking questions and have a conversation. Because people have a lot of questions about, one, the nuns that I worked with in the book, um, nuns generally, and what that means and how, what we can take away and what we can apply to our own lives as Catholics, as non-Catholics, and as productive citizens of a civil society. So if you guys want to, I'm happy to open up to questions. How on earth did you cut it down to the 10 people that you chose? It was so hard. I don't, <laughs> it was so incredibly difficult. Um, I was explaining this uh, at lunch today to someone, and it sounds a little bit cheesy to say it out loud, but I genuinely think that the sisters that I ended up writing, it just it, it fell together. Um, it felt like providence in a way that I was led to each of these women through another one of the women um, unexpectedly. I mean, they don't all know each other at all, and yet someone had heard a whispering about someone doing something, and they would just mention it, and then I would become connected to them. That said, the book, I don't think that it's finished. And so this has become this ongoing storytelling project, which is launching in November, where we're telling the stories of other sisters every single day. And again, so many of the sisters are so humble that the stories are things that I find remarkable, like the first grade teacher that I met that still keeps in touch with all of her students, with everyone she's ever taught. Um, I mean, that means something. That woman had such an impact on the lives of so many children. Um, or the sisters that are down rebuilding homes down in New Orleans on the anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. And so that project is launching in November because there's still stories that need to be told. And so, so many sisters have approached me, and but better than that, it's that I like to say everyone has a nun story, um, because all of the emails that I get are, let me tell you about this sister who changed my life. And then they'll put me in contact with that sister, and so the network has now reached into so many different areas of different people's lives around the globe that I'm just excited to get to continue it. I was wondering how your own religious background and religious studies influenced your writing in the book. Yeah, that's a great question. I grew up Catholic. I went to Catholic school. 
Um, I then I then went to Catholic high school, and I said this at dinner. I was kind of a juvenile delinquent when I was 12 years old. Um, I was just like I was like a bad junior high school student. I don't even know what that means at this point, but they thought that I was like a bad seed. And so I went to Catholic girls' school, and Sister Lane really straightened me out. Um, and I think that's what sparked my interest in Catholic nuns. But I've never been that incredibly rigorous about attending services, especially not as an adult. And I've had a problem with continuing in the Catholic faith. And I mentioned this in the book, that I have an issue with the way that women are treated in the Catholic Church. Um, I am concerned that when I have a daughter, if I have a daughter, I don't ever want to have to tell her that there's something she can't be when she grows up. Um, and that has been my main issue for a long time, and it was my issue with remaining a Catholic until I met these sisters, uh, because they completely changed my perception of what it means to be a woman, to be a Catholic woman, and how those two things intersect, and how you can weave a very intricate spiritual life um, out of that. So. I started out this book process as a very avowed agnostic in a lot of ways. And I say in the book, and I've said in a lot of essays that I've written, I don't know what I believe about God, but I know that I believe in nuns. And so <laughs> for me, um, it's an evolution. And it's a process that I'm going through. And it's a process that I think, I, I call them my nuns. I still talk all of the sisters in the book. I talk to them every single day. I get emails from them. Um, we talk on the phone. And it's a process that they're holding my hand through. And after getting my, I think I got my degree in religious studies because I was fascinated about people that I think that have that God gene, that are, um, they immediately know what they believe. And I never felt that. My, my process is one of learning and experiencing. Um, but it's something that's become more meaningful to me because I've had to go through that process. I didn't immediately get it right away. Uh, based on your interviews, mm -hmm. I'm wondering what you think sisters <coughs> give up. Mm -hmm. And uh, sort of balancing the scale, what do they gain? What they gain. And um, if you were to sort of, uh, if they graded themselves <laughs> on this life that they've chosen, uh, yeah. What is your sense of that? Um, it's a great question because that is the one thing that people ask me every time they find out that I've written a book about nuns. You know, their jaw drops, or they have the immediate gut reaction: "Oh my gosh, sister so and so wrapped my knuckles with a ruler, tied my left hand behind my back, um, was so mean to me." And most of that, I think, is just lives in people's imaginations. They love telling this narrative of the nasty, mean, strict nun, which, and I mentioned this at dinner, that I have said to a lot of the men who have said, male interviewers, interviewers who have said that to me, I'm like, well, did you kind of deserve it? <laughs> <laughs> and they nod, and they lower their heads. Um, and the next thing that people say is, well, how do, they, how, do, how do they give up all of those things? How do, how do they give up a husband? How do they give up kids? How do they give up sex? And I, they're like, did you ask that? Their voice lowers. I'm like, of course I asked that. Um, and the thing is, it was a non-question, non really, because the women that I interviewed didn't feel like they had given up anything, per se. They chose a different kind of life, um, one that is not necessarily what we imagine to be as like the perfect American dream or the perfect dream of most women have of growing up. I'm going to get married. I'm going to have kids. Um, I can tell you, I think that the fact that these women don't have husbands and children has made them so much more productive, particularly the fact that they don't have husbands that they have to take care of. <laughs> um, the women I met don't feel like they've given anything up. And I'm in the process of writing an essay about that right now. Uh, and that they made me feel better about my personal decisions to wait to get married, um, to not know if I want to get married, to not know if I want to have children, because they show that they can live this real and vibrant and authentic life without having those things. And you know, I ask my married friends 
all the time. And Brie was telling me that she had a very similar experience with this uh, when we first talked. I'm like, you know, how how is your marriage going? How is married life? And they're like, eh, it's OK. Um, and you ask all the nuns if they would change anything, if they regret anything, and like how overall their life has turned out. And they're like, is it, it is a 10. It is an A+. Plus. I feel so good about everything that I've done. And so, and that's not to say being a nun is better than this other thing over there, but it is to say that it is such a valid, different life option that I think a lot of people can't wrap their heads around. And so by telling these stories, I think it's opening up that conversation to say that there is a different way that women can choose to live their lives. My first grade teacher in 1963 was Sister Dolores too. She wrapped your knuckles? No, she was nice. <laughs> that came a little later. But she had to be in my, she seemed older then, but she couldn't have been more than 23. Right. Are there 23-year-old nuns in this world today? There's, there are still 23-year-old American nuns. There are still nuns. They're still, they're still out there. And I, I, talk, I do talk about one. I wasn't able to profile um, Sister Sarah Marks. She was one of the first sisters that I interviewed, though, because she had a blog called Mascara and Prayer. And when she started writing it, we were, we're the same age. Um, and so when I started researching the book, I was 28. She was 28. And she was a novice. She was still deciding if this was the life she was going to choose. And she was writing the blog. Um, Sarah is very pretty. She loves mascara. She has a penchant for pretty scarves. She has great hair. And so she's not necessarily what a lot of people think that a nun or a Catholic sister is. And we got to talking, and I asked her when she, she, she finally made the call. She took her vows, her final vows, last year, actually. So we went through the whole process together. And she, I asked her, I'm like, when did you know? When did you know you were going to do this instead of doing that? And she was dating very early on, right before I met her. And she said, look, I went back, I read all my journals, and I realized that when I felt the most empty, when I felt less fulfilled in my life, it was when I was going on dates and when I was living that kind of life. And when I felt most fulfilled was when I was living in community with these women and performing these acts of service. And when I realized that, there was no question. But I told Sarah at the time, and it's true, that she's kind of a unicorn. I mean, she's a woman now in her early 30s who has professed to become a Catholic sister. And the sad fact is that the numbers have severely declined. Um, I mean, the official figures say that the numbers have gone down about 70% since the 70s for American sisters. It's different in other countries, particularly developing countries, particularly in the global south. I mean, there you'll see 17-year-old novices. You'll see all, women in their 20s. It's a very vibrant. It's very different. Um, but here the population's aging. And I think it's a factor of a lot of different things. One of them is that young women today don't have as much contact with Catholic sisters as they used to. Um, most of the Catholic sisters that I interviewed, and in each chapter we talk a little bit about how they felt their call and how they knew. And almost all of them had a sister in grade school or in high school who was kind of a hero figure who helped, who helped them in some way. And so they had that kind of mentor. And I don't think young women have that anymore, and not just when it comes to you know, the Catholic vocation, but I think that we're lacking, young women are lacking that kind of mentorship generally in their lives. And I think it's sad that that, that is the reality in the world today. But I think that is one of the big reasons that we don't see as many young women joining this profession these days. There's obviously lots of other reasons, but the exciting thing that I discovered that I didn't expect at all after I wrote this book is all of the emails that I've gotten from young women, again, Catholics and non-Catholics alike, who are just excited about these stories. And they're just, they're like, they email me things like, well, how can I meet a nun? And I'm like, they're all around you, actually. <laughs> or I'm like, I can give you their email addresses. Hi, Joe. Thank you for this evening, and thank you for the book. My name is Joanne O'Neill DeQuatro. I'm a sister of the Holy Names of Jesus and Mary, 
And the first person I met here tonight that I didn't know was a young woman who'd never met a nun. And I know that there are some of my sisters here in this audience. So would you all stand up and show them who sisters are today, please? <laughs> Come on, you're here. And, and these, these are the nuns. Although I loved your um, introductory paragraph, which made the distinction between those of us who are sisters mm -hmm. and those who are real nuns. Right, right. And um, you have to read the book to get the full <laughs> explanation. But I, I say this because... Um, there are so many people today who don't know who we are because we're not the typical caricature in the black and white habit. And this young gentleman back here who's probably, you know, like my age in reverse. <laughs> but, you know, it's like, when did you stop wearing the habit? Oh my God, I stopped wearing the habit in 1964. <laughs> You know, I mean, who in here was born in 1964? <laughs> so the issue is identity. Mm -hmm. The other thing is what we're doing today. And I guess I, um, I didn't read the whole book because I just bought it today. <laughs> I'm happy that you read even part of it if you just... No, no, no. <laughs> but I skimmed the, um, the table of contents. And probably, and I read the first two chapters, two of whom are people that I know well. One, Megan, who oh, yes. France and I were arrested with years ago at the Nevada test site, and Simone. Oh, I probably heard about you. Yeah, she told me that story. Well, you may have. And Simone, who is a good friend to many of us because she's from LA, but also Janine, mm -hmm. who's been in the trenches for people on the margins in the Catholic Church. And that church today still does not welcome them. I am often asked the question, and it's a two-pronged question, why did you enter religious life? And I was somewhat offended at the first reviews I read about your book and almost didn't buy it because you said things like, um, you know, they couldn't get a man. Well, I turned down a couple of guys, you know. They just <laughs> weren't that interesting to me. It's almost universal in the sisters <laughs> that but, I interviewed. They're like, oh, no, I turned I turn down all the men. <laughs> but I know why I stay. Mm -hmm. And why I stay is because of these women. And whether they belong to the religious community that I belong to, like Susan and Kitty here, it's because we believe in the possibility of making a change in this world, and nobody tells us no, that we can't do it. And so, so I want to thank you because the women that you pointed out are certainly beacons for me, and the women who taught me in high school were an inspiration to me. And I think if you asked any of the other women who stood up, they'd say the same thing, so thank you. Thank you so much, that, that means so much to me, and I'm so glad that you mentioned Simone, because she was one of the first women that I interviewed. Simone Campbell is just a rock star um, in so many ways. She was the master, she's the executive director of the Catholic Lobbying Group Network in DC, but she's also the mastermind be behind the nuns on the bus tour, uh, which was a road trip across America during the 2012 election, fighting against the social service slashing budget, fighting for the rights of the people who live on the margins of society. And it was actually Simone that kind of gave, tacitly gave me permission to say nuns in the title, despite the fact that there, there is absolutely a distinction between nuns and Catholic sisters. I know that. Everyone knows that. Simone told me that when they were trying to decide what to call, what to brand the nuns on the bus tour, sisters on the bus just didn't sound as, as good. It didn't have the same zing. It wasn't going to make the same impact. And I felt the same way about the title, and which is why there is a caveat in the beginning of the book 
um, about that. But Simone was the first sister who really showed me that she was out there on the front lines every day and doing something that as, she reminded me what my job was as a journalist because she got off this bus and she just listened to people's stories. She didn't talk politics. She sat and she listened and she held people's hands and she prayed with them. And it reminded me, at the time I was um, an editor for Current TV. So I was covering progressive politics um, for the network and it was part of the reason that I was actually allowed to even meet up with the nuns on the bus and why I was able to get work to send me there. Um, but I was caught up in the horse race of the election and you're working for a political network, you do and you're looking for traffic and you're looking for a salacious story and you're looking for scandal. And Simone reminded me that my job as a journalist was to sit down and listen and to listen to people's stories and then to, tell, to use this platform that I had to tell their stories and that was what inspired me, I think, to be a better reporter on the campaign trail, but then also helped shape everything that I did for the rest of the book. It helped shape how I sat down with people and just the amount of time that I spent with them. And you raised a great point. I, I want to share a little bit about some of the stories of what the women in the book do. You mentioned Janine, who is one, all of these women are so incredibly inspiring. For more than 40 years, Janine Gramick has been fighting for equal rights for gay and lesbians in the Catholic Church and gay and lesbians in the entire world. She's been fighting for marriage equality. And we all know that that is something that is in direct opposition. We learned it very well this week after the Synod um, with what the Vatican believes. She has never backed down. She has never once wavered. Um, she, her order was threatened with excommunication. Uh, she loved her sisters of Notre Dame so dearly and made a lateral move over to the sisters of Loretto because she didn't want to cause any problems for them. I mean, that, that was where her mind was at. She was so thoughtful of her order. She's like, I, I don't want to cause drama for you um, and has continued that fight to this day. Traveled around the country in 2012 to fight for equality. Um, another sister, Donna Quinn, has been a fierce advocate for women's reproductive rights. Um, Sister Tisa Fitzgerald, the one that I mentioned who's taken in all of the kids, is like this little mayor of this little part of Queens um, who she literally runs all of these businesses where all of her former felons now work, now run, now operate. The last time that I talked to Tisa, we're standing on this street corner in Queens and she's, you know, she's stocky and she's feisty and all the neighborhood cats follow her around. They wind in between her legs as she walks. And she points at this laundromat and she goes, I'm going to own that laundromat before I die. <laughs> and she's going to own that laundromat before she dies. I mean, like, the, all of the sisters that I met, they name what they want to do. They see something they want to help fix a problem in the world. And they go after it no matter what those obstacles are. And I think that's what, what has young women and young Catholic women so jazzed. It's like wow, they're going out there and doing something that's meaningful, and that rocks. You know, I loved your book. I read it in one sitting in just, you know, a few hours. I thought it was really great, accessible, and what I liked about it was that it's something that really everybody could read. Mm -hmm. You know, it sort of appeals to people that are just not, not just Catholics, but in other, you know, faith traditions and de denominations. Um, but what I'd like to ask you um, is how we can kind of build a movement Mm -hmm. within institutions of higher learning to really take the scholarly, you know, study and incorporation of Catholic sisters seriously. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I was an undergraduate, I was a sociology major. As a graduate student, I was also a sociology major. And I was shocked that in classes where I was studying about race and class and gender and religion and socioeconomic status, that we didn't have one conversation one conversation about the role of Catholic sisters in society. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that's true in the fields of communication, in, in theology. I was a religion major as an undergraduate. I don't think I ever had one conversation about Catholic sisters. Nor did I, nor did I have one conversation about them as a master's student at New wow. University. Not one. Well, so what I'd like to know is if you could give the students in the room some advice about how to really build something exciting, some kind of scholarly pursuit or study of Catholic sisters so that we kind of collectively as, 
you know, supporters of higher learning can get the story out. Right. And I think overall Catholics are great at telling other Catholics about wonderful Catholic things. But at the end so, of the day, let's get everybody on board and let's get everybody excited about Catholic sisters. So I just sort of love to hear what you have to say Let's get everybody about talking about it. And okay. that's, that's been the exciting thing for me is to see everybody talking about it. Um, I, ha I experienced the same thing in my women's studies classes, um, in my religious studies classes, I never heard anything about Catholic sisters. And that was part of the reason why they remained such a mystery and such an enigma and why I wanted to study them. And what I come away with from this book is that Catholic sisters were the first feminists in America. Um, I mean, and I'm talking, I'm not talking about the 60s, I'm not talking about the 70s, I'm talking about out on the Kentucky frontier when those nuns were out there building hospitals and building schools and becoming the first the first female presidents of universities and the first women to run hospitals I and mean, they created so many of the institutions in this country but no one no one thought about the fact that they were women because they were nuns and no one really thought about them as feminists because they were nuns and i think that that is a problem i mean i think that it is something that is really missing in the academic study of feminism, the history of feminism, and feminism today. I mean, today's young women should be learning lessons from how the nuns accomplished what they accomplished over the past, not just 100 years, the past 200 years since the founding of this country. Um, and I call, I say it in the book, and I've said it a lot in interviews, I think that that is one of the most ignored feminist issues of our time. And now that we're finally talking about it, it's exciting to see young women engage with it like that. I was at Facebook giving a talk last week, and these are young women in the technology industry. And they had all read the book, and they had such incredible and engaging questions. And they said, we are in this industry that is dominated by men. And it is incredibly hard to be upwardly mobile as a woman. It is a fight. Um, and thank you, because we learned so many leadership lessons and how to overcome obstacles in a male-dominated universe from the nuns. And we never expected to find those kinds of things in your book. And Facebook gave them copies. It's not, they didn't go out seeking this. And yet, that's what they took away. And so that's the conversation that I'm hoping to start with this book and with this continuing project where we talk about these stories um, is that we look at nuns as feminists. And the nuns that I know are proud to say that they're feminists, um, you know, because they were the very first feminists in this country. Professor Robert Putnam of Harvard mm -hmm. um, has done a lot of writing on um, the integration of religious thought in the United States. You're obviously familiar with his uh, writing. And one of the things that he uh, makes a very big point about is that one of the reasons that uh, acceptance of other religions has taken place mm -hmm. here more than other places has been people's personal experience of uh, people, often of other religions, who, even though they don't belong to your religion mm -hmm. and, and they should be one of the club to be able to get into heaven, you see a person who's just so good um, that you just can't believe that they're not going to heaven. Right. And one of the things that really strikes me is um, with your subject matter is you're writing about very inspirational people. And I think one of the things that uh, is often missing in society are uh, role models mm -hmm. and people who inspire us. And, um, and I think particularly, as you just mentioned, this often happens with women. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, I, and I wonder if maybe the nuns have gone a little astray <laughs> in being so humble that they're not available to be role models to people because they don't know they're there. I think it's a fair point and an interesting point. And as I said when, when I first started talking tonight, the sisters in my book did not 
necessarily think of themselves as the subject of a book. And I think that it's because they were taught to be very humble um, and also because they're just doing their job in a lot of ways. This is, this is their calling, this, this, this is their work. And so they don't, see, they're kind of the opposite of celebrities in that way because a celebrity thinks that everything that they do is remarkable. Um, <laughs> And they want to tell you all about it. And they're going to tweet about it, and someone will probably pay them $10,000 to tweet about it. Um, but the nuns are the opposite. And they're so, they're, I think in a lot of ways they've been, and it's, I don't want to say humble to a fault, because humility is a wonderful thing. But now is the time, and I hope that I have gotten the chance to make some women feel more comfortable about telling their stories and being, what you said is absolutely correct. I think that the world lacks role models, not just female role models, male role models. Um, we live in a society that is hungry for those kind of role models, for, the, for that kind of inspiration. I think that's why this has struck a nerve. And thankfully, so many more sisters are asking me if I, I want to not, they're not asking me to tell their story because they're still incredibly humble. They're asking me if I want to hear it. And I do want to hear it. And, I, I'm not humble, so I'm happy to tell their story to the entire world. And I, I think that, that we're going to see a lot of young women reaching out and saying, these are, these are the kinds of women that I want to grow up to be, and this is, this is how I want to model my life. In response to um, talking about nuns being humble, I think there's a, an aspect to our lives that we are not looking to be people of prestige. Mm -hmm. um, we are not nuns in order to be on a pedestal. And that is where some people want to put, you know, they want somebody up there. Right, right. No, it's true. And um, then coupled with that is that um, in the structure of the church, we nuns are lay people just like every other ordinary person. We do not have a place of position. And... Most of us don't want to don't want to be put on that pedestal, and so yeah, there's the dilemma. It's not, it's truth, and I guess humility is truth. Mm -hmm. So well, and a pedestal is a scary scary place to be. And but it's not just being on. If you're on a pedestal, then nobody has to um, follow in your footsteps. Mm -hmm. And what we do, we do in the hopes that we can um, help other people envision that they can also be of service in whatever their life is. Right. And you don't, you don't do that. You don't lean on a pedestal. So. <laughs> That's such a great way of putting it. And one of the things, I, I speak in a very colloquial tone in the book because I wanted the book to be incredibly accessible. And so one of the things, I, I borrowed the tagline of Us Weekly magazine. Um, like nuns, they're just like us. They, they grocery shop. <laughs> they like baseball. Um, because I didn't want the sisters to be on that pedestal. I wanted, I wanted them to be accessible. Their stories are accessible. And as I mentioned about Simone Campbell, she didn't stay on the bus. She got off the bus and sat with the people. And that is, that is the point. Every sister that I met, they got off the bus. They sat down. They listened. They prayed. They cried. Um, Simone put it great. She's like, every time that I talk to someone, my heart breaks open for them again. And that was something that I heard over and over again. And it's because they did make themselves so accessible and so human um, in a way that I think a lot of people and a lot of role models necessarily aren't, especially in this day and age. My name is uh, Susan Maloney. I'm a member of the Sisters of Holy Names, but I'm a member, as Joanne said, of um, all religious communities in the sense. I'd like to thank you for the book. I've only read very little bit of it, but I did send it to somebody for a birthday gift. So, oh, good. Okay. And that was in Canada, so you can put that down. Uh, <laughs> what? I'd like to say one, a couple, three things. One is um, I have written on Feminist Sisters, but it's been published in Europe. Mm -hmm. I did my doctorate here at uh, USC. And I also was the chair of the first MA program in feminist spirituality in the United States. And uh, for reasons 
then I went on to the University of Redlands. My point is about what you've done is a great service to us because um, we're, we live a life that is countercultural, and I'm going to go heavy on the American culture, mm -hmm. and that is self-promotion and the celebrity status, which I think you're marvelous at, the juxtaposition, mm -hmm. you know, that you've gone in your story. Mm -hmm. um, but you, underneath what I'd like to see you and others that are investigating our lives, is the real structural and community power that we have. Mm -hmm. Now, Joanne said, I think you said this, Joanne, you can correct me, sister, uh, <laughs> in terms of the church. And I always want to say, in terms of the hierarchical view of the Catholic Church, and many of us that are Catholic sisters have a different view and vision of the Catholic Church. We're the Catholic Church, too. Mm -hmm. So I have this quest as a teacher to change and say a hierarchical view as you quickly went over the investigation, which I don't know if you're going to get into. But what's really happening with us now is that we have now have a public face of an alternative moral authority for the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And that's very threatening. Now, if you go back in history, Many of the sisters you're talking about on the prairies in Kentucky, New Orleans, San Francisco, whatever, they worked within the church and used that power of the institution to do the service to the people mm -hmm. of God. And the people of God is everybody. It's not just Catholics. So what's really happening today with us is you've got 10 stories but I know the rest of us sitting here, we could tell you 10 more, and I'm sure you can too. But it's the structural impact that our individual lives have together. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to say one thing about the diminishment, and hopefully I'll influence you to change that 70%, is that when religious communities were founded, and I'm going to use my community's example, we had three women who were friends that came together in French and in Canada, in Montreal. And it was through the relationships and what they were doing, they attracted other women. And we had 48 sisters, and 12 of them were sent to California. And that was Kitty? 1868. 1868. And now we have universities, two universities, high schools, grammar schools, all kinds of ministries. So if we could take a look at it, that we're in a period of refounding. Mm -hmm. So numbers is an American game. The more money you have, the better you are. The more you have, the happier you're going to be. But I guess you've discovered that's not true. Not true. So again, if you could put that in your presentation that... Mm -hmm. There's a refounding of the diminishment is something we should not be afraid of. It's making us step back and say, okay, we've been hospitals, we've done schools, what's the next thing? And I think mm -hmm. Simone is on to it in terms of the a network lobby is an independent agency outside of the Catholic Church that is a registered lobby in the United States. Founded by our uh, 30 nuns. And the other is, you haven't gotten to this one yet, but at the United Nations, mm -hmm. there is a non-governmental organization that is solely for, run by Catholic sisters mm. to look at the global issues of um, AIDS, um, uh, trafficking, and water. Mm -hmm. And that was begun by Catholic sisters, and I'll make a plug. The be first executive director was a member of our community. So... What you need to look at there is the strength of the community. And I'm not diminishing your interviews. I think they're terrific. It's very important. But what is that real attraction? Mm -hmm. And it's doing something together, even though we may be perceived as individuals. Are we sisters? No. We're in community. We know that. But I thank you, and I think you're really helping us, and I really appreciate that. Thank you. I, I'm so happy that you raised that because it brings up something that I, I wanted to mention. It was the power of the female connections and female friendships within these 
communities that, that struck me the most. And one thing that I said in my talk last week uh, was that I believe that Catholic sisters were the, before Twitter, before Facebook, before the internet, they were the original social network. Because you could talk to one sister on one side of the country and they would activate their network across the entire country. And I believe that there was such, uh, such amazing things were accomplished because there was this strength of communication and this incredible network and also this incredible, I hesitate to use the word friendship, but the sense of community among the women was so strong that that's why so many things were accomplished. And I'm happy that you said that sisters are stepping back now and saying, okay, what next? Because it, I just want to say, I'm also one of the nuns on the bus. <laughs> so somebody wants to know what that means. I don't think we were on the bus at the same time. No, I was here in California. Okay, I was I was out on the out on the East Coast. Um, and it's so it's it's incredible to see and the number the seventy percent figure that I have I, I I got it from Center for Apostolic Studies at Georgetown and but the number you're right it's such an American thing to say quantity over quality over quality of life, and the fact that sisters are stepping back and saying, okay, what's next? Where do we go? How do we reinvent what we do, who we are, how we're reaching out to people, how we're attracting new young women is more important than those statistics. Absolutely. Many of us really spent a good part of our lives teaching. Mm -hmm. And um, not that we're always proud of the people we teach, but they are people of power and influence. And if you look at the Supreme Court today, not that I'm proud of all the people that nuns taught on the Supreme Court, <laughs> but we have to, we have to acknowledge mm -hmm. that our foremothers, who were largely teachers and uh, people who served in hospitals, they taught amazing people mm -hmm. who wield amazing power. And I think we have to recognize that power in our society, claim it and say, you know, we still have the ability to talk to those people mm -hmm. and influence them today. And that's what many of us in this room try to do. And I'm very proud to be part of that. But I wanted to ask you about the spiritual and religious lives of nuns, because we've heard a lot about them as feminists, as activists, as teachers. But underneath all of that is a, a deep and abiding faith that is really rich. And often we miss that because mm -hmm. we want to turn them into people who act in the public square just like us. And in right. many ways, their religious lives are actually not just like us. So could you talk a little bit about what makes nuns really unique in that way? Absolutely. Absolutely. And each chapter had a similar structure in that you know, I spoke with sisters about what, what made them want to choose this vocation, what made them want to uh, become a Catholic sister, and then we talked a little bit about the things they do now, um, the causes that they fight for, uh, and the way they live their life, but we also focused very heavily on their spiritual lives because I think that it's such an integral part of who they are, and I write early on in the book that um, I talk about God a lot, almost as a character in the book, and it's because of the way that the sisters I met communicate with God. And it was so unique to me, as someone who's figuring out my own religious path, that it was worth me noting in that God is a part of the everyday fabric of their lives. Um, it is an ongoing character. It is someone they have conversations with. Um, some of the sisters have those conversations out loud. Um, which is jarring at first to realize, who are you talking? Oh, God. Um, but it was something that just felt so comfortable and so natural that you never felt as, I never felt as if any of the sisters were wearing their, their faith on their sleeve. Um, it was something that they simply practiced on their own themselves and in community. Um, 
you know, there was there were morning prayers, there were nightly prayers, there were prayers on their own, and those prayers, when they were explaining them to me as a layperson and to some of my friends that I, I brought around um, when I was doing these interviews, they were like, it's like, it's meditation, it's like spending time with your dearest, oldest friend, and that's what made me want to deepen my, my own faith, was seeing their very close relationship with God. And that, that was part of what ended up becoming so fulfilling to me throughout this whole process. Joe, thank you so much for sharing with us uh, about this great book you've put together. And thank all of you for coming out. Let's give Joe a great round of applause. <laughs>